My mother told me at an early age that there are five points to a good speaker. Get up, stand up, speak up, shut up, and sit down. And I shall endeavor to do that this morning. My father's father, John Lee, was half Irish and half black. His complexion was about the same as any Caucasian, as was my father. He married Phyllis Francine Busher, who was half Indian and half black, the daughter of Chief John Busher of the Blackfoot Indian tribe, based in Missouri, later moved to a reservation in Montana. After her death, some years later, he had a second marriage at 95. He married a 38-year-old woman, and they had three more children, the last of whom was born when he was 100, and he lived until she was 14. My mother's father, Henry Jones, was born on the island of Madagascar, off the southern coast of Africa. He was half Spanish and half African. He was very dark complexion with very straight black hair. He married Sarah Mitchell, who was part French, part Indian, and part black. After her husband's death, she was married again to Henry Lee, the nephew of General Robert E. Lee, who, after escaping from slavery, came north to fight in the Civil War. She lived for 99 years. My parents and seven children were born in Collinsville, Illinois, a small town outside of St. Louis, Missouri. Well, except Grandma Sarah. We didn't have transportation in those days as we have now. Most families had more than one car. Once a year to visit the grandparents. Though my grandparents were old enough to have been slaves, they were fortunate enough to be settled in the north. My great-great-grandmother, however, was a slave who had her children sold away from her because of disobedience to the master. She was too valuable to whip, so he punished her by selling her children away. But after the slaves were freed, she was reunited with them. I've had many people ask, wouldn't it be simpler if we were all the same color? Well, think about it. We all once were the same color when we arrived in this country. But because of the greed of some of the masters who picked out the healthy, strong black women and had children by them, thus making more slaves to sell, we began to be all colored, from very light to very dark brown. Now, my grandmother would come to visit us several months each year. She was kept busy darning socks, patching clothes, knitting stocking caps, mittens, and scarves, and making patchwork quilts from leftover scraps from the clothes my mother had made all of it. And while she worked, she sang. And I learned many hymns and spirituals I sing today from her. I attended an elementary school where I was one of three black children. During my junior high and senior high years, I wanted to take typing when I reached high school and shorthand. My teacher tried to discourage me, saying it would be a waste of time if I couldn't get a job using these skills in this area. But my folks encouraged me to take the course, saying that whatever I learned could not be taken away from me, and you never could tell when it would be useful. Right here, I'm going to read a poem that my mother gave me over 50 years ago. She preached this to each one of us. Believe in yourself. Believe you were made to do any task without calling for aid. Believe without growing too scornfully proud that you, as the greatest and least, are endowed. A mind to do thinking, two hands and two eyes, are all the equipment God gives to the wise. Believe in yourself. You're divinely designed and perfectly made for the work of mankind. This truth you must cling to through danger and pain. The heights man has reached, you can also attain. Believe to the very last hour, for it's true. 
that whatever you will, you've been gifted to do. Believe in yourself and step out unafraid. By misgivings and doubt, be not easily swayed. Use the right to succeed. The precision of skill which betokens the grace you can earn, if you will. The wisdom of ages is yours if you agree, but you've got to believe in yourself to succeed. Now, I have sung at almost every older church in Cedar Rapids, but I always knew I was a visitor. There were no black members at any Protestant churches in the 30s and 40s. But there were several families that belonged to the Immaculate Conception Catholic Church. Now, my husband was raised by his grandparents from the time he was nine months old. He went by their name, Reeves. My maiden name was Reeves. We had several classes together in junior and senior high school. And being seated alphabetically, we were also seated near each other. However, he was too young for me at that time. But about three years after graduation, we were married. I was attending co-college at Cedar Rapids at that time, and as there were no provisions for married students in those days, we just stopped the education there and were married. And my grandmother attended my wedding at the age of 95 and lived to see our son Bob before she died at 99. Our son is affiliated with this educational institution, and they have four children, one of whom is here this morning. Four years later, we had a daughter, Mary, who was employed at Rockwell International in personnel, but who has moved here and is now general manager and co-owner of PWA Publishing and Classic Communications Incorporated. They have two children. After I had been married for 12 years and with both children in school, I went to work at Rockwell International in 1952 as a typist in the Technical Publications Department. I was the second black hired in the office. There were many on the production line, but only one before me in the office. Because of my language background, they purchased a special typewriter with the accent mark. We had a large contract for instruction books in Spanish, and it was my job to type and proofread them with a Spanish teacher from the high school. After seven years, I became editor. And you know, you have to blow your own horn sometimes. When I found out that this job was open, I went to my boss and asked, him if he would consider me for the position. He said, well, you know, you have to have three years college to get this. I said, well, you know, I've had seven years experience typing these books in a Collins manner. I said, you have a four-year graduate, you have master's degree people, but they have had no more grammar than I've had. I have had one year of English grammar, one year of German grammar, one year of French grammar, and I feel that I could stand up with them anytime, editing engineering reports and books. Well, he said, you have a point there. The only thing you would have to learn then is how to sign figures. Several months later, he told me he would give me a three-month probationary period in which I would see if I still liked the job. Well, I became an editor, editing instruction books, engineering reports, brochures, bids, and proposals. After 18 years, I was promoted to scheduler, scheduling all the work through the department to meet the specified date and deadline, and managing the department in the absence of my immediate supervisor. And at the end of 28 years, I retired in 1981. Now, I'd like to emphasize that our teachings in our early life have a significant effect on us as adults. For instance, the folks taught us at an early age to be on time for church, on time for jobs, to be honest, accept responsibility, and to be dependable. 
My dad worked as a janitor at the Union Depot in Cedar Rapids, a railroad train station. He worked for years and years, no paid vacation, no time off for holidays, half day on Sunday, half day on all holidays. My mom was a very zealous Christian. She and I not only attended our church, all the services, but we visited other er others in the area and read background information on still more. I went with her gladly because I enjoyed the music. And right here, I'm going to read another poem that she gave me which expressed her sentiments about religion. When the talk turns to religion, I have notions of my own, have my version of the Bible and the things I think alone. And I find them mighty satisfying and comforting to me, but I'll not lose my temper if you chance to disagree. For religion, as I view it, is a pathway to a goal, and is a thing that must be settled by each man and his soul. I'm not a Presbyterian, but I wouldn't go so far as to cast aside the friendship of some dear friends I know who are. I have lived in neighbors with them, learned to love them through and through, and I admire them and respect them for every kindly thing they do. And I've come to this conclusion, though the bigots may think it's odd, that it makes no difference to me how any good man worships God. I know Methodists and Baptists, Lutherans, Catholics, Unitarians, and Jews, whose friendship is a treasure that I surely hate to lose. I love them and respect them, and I surely wouldn't condemn any form of prayer and worship which is comforting to them. So when the talk turns to religion, I just look around and see the many friends and loyal ones every church has given to me. I studied voice for about 14 years, intending to be a concert singer. I learned to sing in German, French, Latin, Italian, Spanish, Czech, and I'm still continuing to learn. I've been working on a Hebrew and African dialect, Swahili. Over the years, there has not been much of a demand in our area for classical vocal music, and so I've been going about singing for schools, churches, and other organizations, sharing my background and heritage with others. Now, during the 30s and 40s, we had vaudeville shows, stage shows in our town. There were no hotel or restaurant accommodations, thus performers, performers such as Duke Ellington, Cass Calloway, Ella Fitzgerald, Nat King Cole, Louis Armstrong, the Bill Brothers, and others stayed at our home and our, my mother cooked meals for them after the show. Now we're coming to the program proper. You know who I am now. I always like to start this part of the program with a poem by the late James Weldon Johnson, a tribute to unknown bars. Oh, black and unknown bars of long ago, how came your lips to touch the sacred fire? How in your darkness did you come to know the power and the beauty of the minstrel's life? Who first from midst his bonds lifted his eyes? Who first from out the still white long and long, feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise within his dark hemp soul, burst into song? How of what slave poured out such melody as steal away to Jesus? On its train, his spirit must have nightly broken free, though still about his hands. He felt his king. Who heard great Jordan roll, and who was he that breathed that comforting melodic sigh? Nobody knows the trouble I see. What merely living clod, what captive thing could up toward God through all its darkness broke, and find within its dead heart to sing these songs of sorrow, love, and faith and hope? How did it catch that subtle undertone, that note in music? heard not with the ear. How sound the elusive reed, so seldom blown, which stirs the soul or melts the heart to tears. Not that great German master in his dream of harmonies that thundered amongst the stars of creation ever heard a theme nobler than go down Moses. Mark its barn, how like a mighty trumpet call they stir the blood. Such are the notes that men have sung going to valorous deeds. Such tones there were that helped make history when time was young. 
There is a wide, wide wonder in it all that from degraded rest and servile toil the fiery spirit of the fear can call these simple children of the sun and soul. Oh, black slave singers, gone for God, unfeigned, you, you alone of all the long, long line of those who some untaught, unknown, unnamed, have fetched out upward, seeking the divine. You sang not deeds of heroes or of kings, no chant of bloody war, no exalting paean of arms won triumph, but your humble strings you touched in chord with music and period. You sang far better than you knew. The songs that for your listeners hungry hearts the fight still live. But more than this to you belong. You sang a race from wood and stone to Christ. In 1619, 20 African laborers were brought to Jamestown, Virginia by the captain of a Dutch ship. They were left as indentured servants. These people had to work to pay for their transportation, their clothes, their food, and so on, for a brief length of time, and then were free. Some became landowners, and some even slave <coughs> This was the beginning of the African slave trade in the American colony. The other blacks that followed later came from various localities. They didn't speak the same language, and here in America they were suddenly cut off from their native culture, scattered without regard to their old tribal relations, having to adjust to a completely alien civilization, having to learn a strange language, and moreover, held under an increasingly harsh system of slavery. Yet it was from these people that this mass of noble music sprang this music that is America's only folk music. Now the black seized on religion, a religion that implied the hope that in the next world there would be a reversal of religion. The Old Testament story caught and fixed the imagination of these people and they sang their listeners into a firm faith that if God saved Daniel in the lion's den, so he would save them. If God preserved the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, so he would preserve them. As God delivered Israel out of bondage from Egypt, so he would deliver them. As the years go by, and I understand more about this music and its origins, the miracle of its production strikes me with increasing wonder. Melody had a relatively small place in African music, and harmony still left. But in rhythm, African music is still beyond comparison with any other music in the world. There are roughly two divisions in the rhythm. Rhythms based on the swinging of the head and body, and rhythms based on the tapping of the feet and the clapping of the hands. And it's difficult, it's not impossible, if you feel what you're singing, to sing these songs sitting or standing still, and at the same time, capture the spontaneous swing. The earlier spirituals were built upon forms so common to African songs, leading lines and responses. And it would be safe to say that the bulk of the spirituals are cast in this simple form. Now you've seen on TV safari, and you see the groups of men who are unloading the equipment from the boat. And you'll hear a line chanted by one, we'll call this the leading line. And you hear the group respond, all in rhythm, as they do their work. As an example of this, I'd like to sing Twin Low Three Chariots. The first line is the leading line, and the other is the group. <coughs> we know, we For to carry me home, swing low, sweet chariot. Come for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? Come for to carry me home, a band of angels are coming after me. Come for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet cherry. Come for to 
that it was natural that these people, when introduced to hearing melody and harmony, began to sing more and more after reaching this country. The sorrow of his enslavement probably stirred him to sing more than ever, as is shown in the words of his next song. I've included this in the program. I have, four years ago, I auditioned for a musical presentation called The Folly. I had been to some of them. They are voluntary uh, people who sing audition for this. They have a gorgeous chorus, 100 people uh, singing. But there are only about five black people. Now, there's got a lot of people that sing there. Only about five went to audition to be in this. And I thought it was Back to America was the name. I thought maybe there's a place in there that I would fit in. So I auditioned one Sunday afternoon, and I got a letter that said I was going to be a solo. I sat there and listened. Now, I'm old enough to be the grandmother of most of the people in there. <laughs> but I thought, well, I have to hold up the banner of the senior citizen. <laughs> They had, back to America, had a time capsule that took us back into the 1800s. I was in the first scene. They had a plantation, to be, they, they had volunteers to paint the scenery and, and uh, 30 volunteers to uh, make the clothing and all that sort of thing. We have a plantation scene. We have the ladies dressed in their beautiful taffeta pa dresses with the parasols to match and the cutaway coats on the gentlemen. And they sing Beautiful Dreamer and, and Dixie and, uh, oh, some others, they camp town race and so on. And then there is the stage is darkened. And we come down to the other side of the corner. The violin plays softly. And how I come walking to the center of the stage. And I have on a long calico dress with a white apron, with a white turban for my hair, and with large earrings on. Now one of the girls, the other black young woman who was in the show, said, when I saw that they were going to have this in there, I started not to be in it. I said, why? That's part of history. I don't want these people in this audience to forget it. I will not forget it. For it was on the backs of these people that you got your position in the largest bank in St. Rapids today. I don't want them to forget. I want them to remember. So I came out. I had bronchitis. I couldn't talk. But I did what my mother always told me to do. Before you go in front of anybody to do anything, you pray a prayer that the Lord will help you to do it the best that you can. I did this. I walked to the front of the stage and I started to sing, Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows the season. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Begin to clap. And I asked my daughter, who was out in the audience, 
how did you think the people liked it? She said there was a lot of people who had hanging dog moms. <laughs> <laughs> well, one noted musicologist has suggested that Beethoven would have delighted in spirituals and Brahms would have borrowed them as the boycott did in his New World Symphony. And a considerable portion of today's opera Carmen is also based on African rhythm. Now, there were many whites in our area who thought the system of slavery was very unfair. Thus, the Underground Railroad existed in Iowa for about 10 years before the Civil War. Muscatine, Iowa was on the main route. The term Underground Railroad was taken from a southern slave owner who said the Negroes escaped to Canada as easily as if they traveled on a railroad that runs the ground. Freedom from slavery and freedom from life itself were often synonymous in thought. Hence we have, do any of you sing in here by any chance? Can I get some to help me as I sing? Get on board, little children. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can't get a little mic in this now. <laughs> Get on board, little children, get on board, little children, get on board, little children, there's room for many on board, well, get on board.
starring Sidney Poitier and a group of nuns. Yes. And he was a contractor, and the mother superior inveigled him into staying there to rebuild the church. And every morning he would sit down with them at breakfast, the mother superior at that end, he was at this end, the nuns lined up, and he listened to them sing their morning prayers, on you days, Ave Maria. One morning he said, Sister, I'm going to sing you a song of my people. And he began to sing, and I want you to do this one with me also. Now you keep going once we get started, because this is a little bit like rubbing the tummy and passing the head. I'm going to sing you <laughs> Expresses one of the central experiences of Black America. 
It is part of the black heritage and its history should be taught, preserved, and respected. Now I'm going to uh, finish this program not with a gospel song because you need some piano and some rhythm behind you there, you know. <laughs> so I'd ask you to join with me in singing. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the rich and the poor. In his hands, he's got the rich and the poor. In his hands, he's got the rich and the poor. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world.